Good evening and welcome. I'm Philip Cray, the president of the Lutheran Theological Seminary at Philadelphia, and I'm delighted to welcome you on behalf of the, the dean and faculty, our trustees, and all our students and staff to this first lecture and the beginning of a series in what we're launching, the Mount Airy School of Religion. And th this series uh, will be called Creation, Fall, and Flood. And you should have found on your seats, if you sat down on them, get up and uh, <laughs> look there. Uh, not on yours, uh, Your Honor. Uh, um, but uh, there are a few things. One is a, a survey asking you what, what you would like to have uh, in this series. Um, and another is a, is a flyer about the, the course itself that uh, is being launched this evening. We, we intend to tackle very serious uh, issues uh, in this series in, a, in our way of doing public theology. Uh, to, to invite our faculty and others uh, to address issues that you're all interested in. Of course, we have to find out what you're interested in, hence the, uh, the survey. We're excited about this new program, and if uh, you can't afford the stated fee, talk to the folks out front, tell them the president sent you, um, and um, we'll, um, we'll provide financial aid and, and all the rest. Professor Wenger will help out. Um, uh, on, on that. Um, the, after the two presentations, we're going to allow time for questions, and Professor Melinda Quivick will be the moderator. She's an assistant professor of practical theology, Christian Assembly. So save your questions till after both uh, speak. I, I want to just thank a few people uh, for coming. Uh, and helping on this, uh, Diane Semmingson from DLS International Incorporated invited um, the judge to be here this evening, so thank you uh, to Diane. Um, we're also very uh, grateful that his pastor has come, uh, Pastor Harold Hand, and so we welcome uh, Pastor Hand. And we have some community leaders here, uh, Rabbi George Stern, who's the executive director of, uh, I've got to get this right, right, Neighborhood Interfaith Movement. Uh, welcome, uh, Rabbi. And um, Rachel Falcove is here, and she's the director of the Interfaith Hospitality Movement. Um, welcome. Uh, and we also have representatives from We Man, um, uh, Laura Siena, and um, also Jarma Frisbee. So, Welcome. Senator Washington was going to come, but they're in session, uh, and so she asked to be excused. Uh, brief words about our two speakers, and I will take my seat. The Honorable Judge Johnny Jones III has been the United States District Judge since August 2002 and was appointed by President George W. Bush and unanimously confirmed by the United States Senate in July 2002. That's an accomplishment. Uh, Judge Jones will share with us this evening his ruling in the Kitzmiller versus Dover School District case, uh, some comments on it, uh, background information that we're eager to hear. Um, and this is the case that the Dover School District could not introduce intelligent design into the biology curriculum. We will hear later from Professor Robert B. Robinson from our faculty the Anna Burkhalder Professor of Old Testament and Hebrew, who will address creation according to scripture and share explorations of the Bible's reflection on our most formative questions. And now it's my pleasure to introduce to you the Honorable Judge John E. Jones III. Thank you very much for that uh, gracious uh, introduction, and it is truly a pleasure to uh, be with you uh, tonight. Uh, we federal judges don't get out much, and uh, whenever I can get invited someplace to, uh, to speak, it's a, uh, a happy occasion for me. Uh, when uh, Diane Semmingson uh, invited me to uh, 
uh, or, or asked me to consider uh, coming to this uh, event. Uh, it was several months ago, and it was before I released the, the uh, decision in the uh, Kitzmiller versus Dover case, and I asked her if she wanted to wait and hedge her bets uh, and uh, see what the decision would be, and she graciously said, no, I want to get you uh, committed now, uh, regardless of what your decision is. And so it is a pleasure to talk to you tonight, and um, it is coincidental to my appearance that uh, I am, as was noted, I think, or alluded to, uh, and I re recognize that you're all not Lutherans, although we are uh, at a Lutheran uh, seminary, but I am a Lutheran, and uh, I belong to Trinity uh, Lutheran Church in Pottsville, and uh, as you also heard, I never leave home without my pastor, and uh, he... Uh, <laughs> And uh, so uh, Pastor Hand was gracious enough to come all this way and to, uh, and to view my remarks tonight, and I appreciate that uh, more than he can know. Uh, years ago, I was a member of a Presbyterian church uh, in Pottsville uh, until I met my wife in uh, 1981, and you can see who the boss is in the family because I've been a member of Trinity Luther since, uh, since uh, 1982. And uh, I uh, have had a great... Uh, experience at uh, Trinity. I was married by, uh, uh, and, and you, some of these names may be familiar to some of you and not to others, but uh, Bayard Ebling was the senior pastor, uh, married us in uh, 1982, and uh, after that, uh, Pastor Phil Bendel uh, took over uh, at uh, Trinity, and um, Pastor Bendel was close enough to me that uh, he was actually interviewed by the uh, Federal Bureau of Investigation when they went through my background check, uh, but, uh, uh, and, I, and he spoke at my investiture ceremony, and uh, very, uh, very sadly and tragically, uh, Pastor Bendel passed away just a year after uh, I became a judge. I thought a lot about him uh, during the uh, process of uh, hearing and deciding this case, but uh, we are very blessed to have Pastor Hand uh, as a... Uh, uh, successor uh, to uh, to uh, Pastor Ebley and Pastor Bendel in a succession of great ministers, at, uh, great pastors at, uh, at Trinity Lutheran. Um, men of faith uh, have been uh, uh, important to me uh, in my life and uh, in my uh, in my career. And it's fair to say that I wouldn't be a district judge without uh, their abundant support and good words. I. Uh, come to you tonight, obviously, and I said this to Diane when she asked me to speak, I said, well, you know, I, I'm, I'm not a theologian, and, uh, and, I, and I feel somewhat uncomfortable uh, about uh, giving an address in, in this uh, setting, and she assured me that uh, there were other things that uh, I could talk about uh, that uh, might be helpful to you uh, and might uh, uh, be of interest uh, to you. Uh, I am uh, temporarily uh, uh, famous or infamous, as the case may be, uh, based on a particular case that uh, that I uh, I just handled, and I, I uh, certainly uh, am not a constitutional expert. Now that sounds odd, uh, coming from a federal judge, but there are uh, folks who are better qualified than I am to discuss the nuances of the uh, of the Constitution. I have some skill in that area. And I have some uh, recent skill as it relates to the Establishment Clause as contained in the First Amendment of the uh, Constitution. <laughs> but I did receive, too, a mini-education uh, in the area of the intersection of religion and the law. And I think that that makes probably my views of some interest to you and topical, notwithstanding the caveats uh, that uh, I'm not an expert in uh, in uh, either field. We have to be careful what we say as federal judges. We try to avoid making news beyond the decisions that we, uh, that we render, but um, I think that tonight it's important for me to talk about a couple of areas that, are, um, that, I, that I'm fairly certain will be of interest to you, and uh, they involve, uh, first, uh, some misconceptions that I believe uh, are present about the origins of the separation of church and state, that uh, concept. And uh, I want to make some comments as well about the uh, issue or the, or, the, or the concept of the ancillary issue of judicial independence. And I'll talk a little bit about the Dover case too, obviously, because that's of interest um, to the extent that uh, I think it's appropriate. And the history tells us that the founding fathers, as influenced by the Enlightenment, 
had a great confidence, a uh, great degree of confidence in an individual's or in the individual's ability to understand the world and its most fundamental laws and uh, that they would do this through the exercise of his or her reason. And this, of course, and it's been written about abundantly, extended to religion. And the founders, it's pretty clear, uh, believed that true religion was not something handed down by a church or contained in the Bible, but that it was to be found through free, rational inquiry. And at bottom, uh, this core set of beliefs led the founders to secure their idea of religious freedom by barring any alliance uh, between church and state. Judges uh, are often tempted to embark on what I think is best described as a fool's errand, which is to examine pronouncements by the founding fathers and then attempt to divine through those pronouncements, this is outside the bounds of the Constitution, but to divine from these pronouncements, these writings, how they would resolve a, a current debate or a controversy. And I try to avoid that. I think, I think it's best to avoid that. Nowhere in the Dover opinion will you catch me ruminating about how Thomas Jefferson might have dealt with the concept of intelligent design. <laughs> However, there is a quote uh, by Jefferson, uh, which in particular was repeated uh, throughout uh, and at great length uh, throughout uh, the uh, Dover trial and before and after the trial. After his election as uh, president of the United States in uh, the year 1800, Jefferson received many letters from uh, evangelicals um, who expressed uh, their appreciation for his firm support of religious liberty. That was part of his platform uh, when he ran. And it was in response to one of these letters that Jefferson used the metaphor of a wall of separation between church and state. And in the, the very pitched and, and uh, white hot debate over intelligent design uh, and during the trial, many people observed that Jefferson and only Jefferson uh, imposed that wall that it nowhere appears in the Constitution, and that its mention uh, must essentially have been idiosyncratic. Now, I, I would pause uh, to note that there is some uh, irony in this, in, in my view, in that uh, while the evangelicals of 1800 uh, were gladdened by Jefferson's reference to a wall, uh, many folks today uh, who would deem themselves to be evangelicals uh, view that reference as the root of all evil. Uh, I would respectfully submit that those, two, those who uh, would choose to read Jefferson's wall reference as the idiosyncratic and isolated meanderings of one man are in error. And I think rather this statement was not unique to Jefferson, that it expressed the uh, true intent and the will of the founders. And in fact, uh, Jefferson's reference was contained in a letter, uh, where it was found, actually, uh, was in a letter to the Danbury Baptists of Connecticut. And they had written uh, to him, and he was responding to their writing, and they had written to him to, con to congratulate Jefferson on his election. They lauded his election, uh, in particular, because Connecticut at that time was one of the states that had retained a religious establishment. Now, Jefferson's Choice of language was unique, but the sentiment, uh, as I said, I, uh, was decidedly not. The Establishment Clause uh, reflected uh, something that the founders felt very deeply about. Now, it's impossible to know whether any of the founders foresaw, of course, the, constitu the constitutional and the social debate that the United States embarked upon relating to the Establishment Clause, and one which in particular has... Um, uh, been uh, fairly well developed uh, starting about 60 years ago and has reverberated throughout uh, several generations and many iterations of uh, judges and certainly the Supreme Court. And that takes me to uh, my experience with the great debate, which was the Kitzmiller versus Dover trial. And as, I, as was noted earlier, I've been on the bench since 2002. And by December of uh, 2004, I had decided some fairly interesting cases. I had no idea uh, that in that month something was going to hit my docket, uh, which would be different and perhaps more interesting than anything that I had before. 
I was driving home from my chambers uh, in Harrisburg on a uh, nice December day in uh, 2004, and I heard on the radio that a group of parents had filed a lawsuit uh, challenging the Dover uh, School District's policy about uh, intelligent design and specifically uh, uh, interjecting uh, intelligent design into the science classroom. Now, I, I like to think, like most of us, that I'm fairly well read and worldly wise, but I have to tell you that at that moment, if I had heard about intelligent design, uh, I couldn't remember hearing about it, and I had no idea what uh, intelligent design meant or, or what it was, and I certainly do now. Uh, I. Uh, <laughs> And my curiosity was piqued because as a federal judge coming from the Middle District of Pennsylvania, I wondered whether the case would be assigned to me. And um, uh, it's a random assignment of cases. And so the next day when I went to my chambers and I fired up my computer and I looked to see case assignments uh, for the previous day, I saw the initials JEJ after Kitzmiller versus Dover. And I, and I was not displeased. Uh, most of us uh, will tell you, most federal judges will say that they uh, assume their positions so that they could decide important cases. I thought here was a constitutional challenge, looked like an interesting case. I had no idea uh, just how interesting it was going to become uh, uh, past uh, that point. I scheduled the, subsequently a scheduling conference uh, in the case, and um, that was about a year ago, uh, or about a year and a month ago. And I saw the lawyers, many of them, uh, for the first time. Uh, lawyers outnumbered the parties some days in the court. And it was evident to me at that uh, early point in time that the case was not going to settle uh, and that uh, we were embarking on what could be very protracted uh, uh, litigation. I will tell you that uh, in the case, as an aside, uh, the lawyers uh, to, a, to a person uh, distinguished themselves. And uh, uh, I, uh, I was privileged to have the uh, lawyers in front of me. Um, you may agree or disagree with the decision, but uh, the, uh, the highest ideals of the uh, legal profession were truly upheld, I think. And I'm not talking about my part of it. I'm talking about the lawyers and the cases that they presented to me. Uh, they were, um, they were marvelous throughout the uh, case. I think that it's fair to say that the lawyers had a very palpable sense that they were involved in something bigger and different than anything they had ever experienced, let alone me. And um, I watched as some very good lawyers, some excellent lawyers, became even better. And uh, it was clear that uh, they took their games up uh, a few notches to, to um, fit the case that they uh, found themselves uh, in. And uh, it was, uh, if you enjoy sports uh, metaphors, it was certainly a playoff game, if not the Super Bowl, for the lawyers uh, who were involved in it. We commenced the trial, as most of you know, in September of uh, last year. And for the ensuing six weeks, we, uh, we uh, stayed at it. Uh, and um, I will tell you that as judges, we labor most days in uh, relative obscurity. Uh, most people don't know what we do uh, day to day. When I arrived at the uh, United States Courthouse in Harrisburg on the first day of the uh, Dover trial, I uh, saw that the, uh, and this was not necessarily unexpected by that time, but it does give you pause, uh, the, the courthouse was ringed by satellite trucks. The um, hallways were jammed with uh, uh, visitors, security. Um, security, despite our best uh, efforts, was somewhat overloaded. We had electronic and print media from around the world. Uh, as has been pointed out, I think, in the press, Charles Darwin's great-great-grandson was in attendance at the trial. Um, there was generally a circus atmosphere which, uh, which uh, pervaded the courthouse. And I can't know what's happening in the courtroom until I emerge from chambers. It's not good uh, practice for me to be wandering around greeting people like they're on a, a television talk show uh, before I come out. But so, so I, I did not know uh, what I would find. And uh, when I emerged from chambers and took the bench, uh, there, was, there was such a crowd in the courtroom and it was so filled with electronic equipment and there was such a sketch artists, uh, lawyers, parties, marshals, um, some very identifiable faces in the media uh, that uh, it, it almost took my breath away. And it took me a second when I got on the bench to sort of calm myself down um, uh, because I'd, I'd never seen it, nor had I experienced anything like it. Uh, 
when the plaintiff's counsel, uh, Eric uh, Rothschild, one of the uh, co-counsel for the plaintiffs, began to uh, give his opening presentation, uh, he used uh, a, a screen. Uh, we had monitors at all of our stations, uh, the lawyers and judge, and uh, he was using these aids uh, to augment his presentation. And um, early in his opening remarks, he um, had a shot of primates uh, go up. And as I looked at the monkeys uh, on the wall of the courtroom, just a few moments into the trial, I was gripped for the very first time uh, with the thought that uh, I could be presiding over something that, uh, at least in its time, was viewed as historic. Um, not only historic, but maybe uh, a newer version of the great Scopes monkey trial. And I had a very palpable sense that I could be actually living history. And if you've ever experienced that, it is, it is um, uh, to, to say the least, an interesting, um, an interesting feeling. Now, despite uh, all the, uh, uh, the tumult that attended the first day, we were able to settle down for the long trial that followed. And you've read about it. And I'm not going to try to review in detail what happened here. But we did conclude in November. And uh, we embarked upon the harder work, I think, uh, in, to some degree of fashioning an opinion. And I handed down that opinion on December the 20th of, um, of uh, this past December. And that brings me really to the next area, because before and after the ruling, some curious things happened to me in terms of the media's reaction in particular and the, the punditry um, and others' uh, reaction to, to the opinion and to my work. And I think the reactions uh, are indicative of the times, and um, I think they're examples of what can happen to judges in high-profile cases, but they have some larger issues that really relate to the separation of church and state, if you will, and, and to, uh, uh, to uh, judicial independence. I, I made a considered decision during the uh, trial that I would make myself available uh, to some degree to the press. Not all judges do that. I thought that uh, it, it made sense uh, to do that because, uh, after all, you pay our salaries. Uh, I think the public has a right to know how we go about doing our work. Uh, we shouldn't excessively try to explain that which we put in writing in our decisions and comment. Uh, we should never comment on the merits of a case, particularly when it's under deliberation. But uh, I, I, I really believe that in part because of that, um, the, the, uh, the, the media understood uh, uh, fairly well, uh, and in some cases exquisitely well, exactly uh, what uh, the case was about, what was at stake, the tests that were used uh, uh, by me in deciding the case, and, um, and uh, I think it was a beneficial uh, experience uh, for all because of that. Now, on the other hand, um, you, you do get uh, some questions that are befitting of Oprah Winfrey when you get interviewed uh, in that uh, setting. Uh, such as, and I have some favorites, what's your favorite sports team? How many times a week do you work out? And, the, and my favorite question, which is, who do you want to play you in the movie version of the, uh, uh, the trial? And, if, and for the record, the Philadelphia Eagles, six times a week, and Tom Hanks. Uh, and, uh, and, and I, and I also, I also uh, became aware during the trial that, that uh, uh, things that I said uh, – were, were regarded as um, as witty, and uh, that uh, I became known for having somewhat of a sense of humor. This received a great deal of play in the media. Now, I want to tell you that uh, uh, in a trial like this, uh, despite all the publicity, there are many really deadly stretches, and anything that's remotely humorous uh, is a welcome break in the monotony. But here's the, here's the great secret. When you're the presiding judge, you're always a lot funnier, uh, <laughs> particularly to the lawyers uh, who, who, who fall all over themselves to laugh at your jokes, uh, whether they're, they're funny or not. And there's a fine line between good humor and turning a trial into uh, my cousin Vinny, uh, which, which I certainly didn't want to do. And two, uh, I will say that Court TV wanted to televise this case uh, nationally from start to finish, and this is a serious note, and I declined that, uh, I denied that, uh, because, uh, and very seriously, I think the great negative role model for all of us on the trial bench uh, is uh, poor Judge Ito. Uh, we, we hold him up as, the, as, as what not to do, and in retrospect, perhaps I should have allowed it because the lawyers really distinguished themselves, but I made a decision that uh, 
uh, that was a distraction that uh, I did not want to have. Uh, perhaps some days um, we will have uh, uh, wire-to-wire uh, television coverage of federal trials, but we're not at that point yet. And again, in the humorous vein, uh, I had the pleasure of reading an article, for example, in New Yorker magazine after the trial in which the reporter, Margaret Talbot, attributed to me the charm of a 1940s movie star, and she commented that I looked and sounded like a cross between actors Robert Mitchum and William Holden, which was great, except my wife and children found that utterly hilarious. <laughs> and my law clerks, who are in their mid-20s, deflated me. They deflated me by asking me, they said, Judge, who are Robert Mitchum <laughs> and, 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 and William Holden? So I decided the case in December, and the, the controversy that attended the release of the decision, the necessary controversy, brings me to this additional area, and that is the topic of judicial independence. And, and I want to talk about what that means in, in the context of this case. Uh, most, if not uh, all, uh, and there were some that were not good, but most of the reviews of my decision were good. We don't make our decisions based on what we expect the reviews will be, uh, but you certainly uh, uh, heartened uh, when you get a good review. And I'd like to tell you that uh, I don't read the reviews of my decision and that I'm... Uh, I, leave, I lead this cloistered life, and, and I don't look at that, but I'm human, and I do, and, uh, and, and certainly I understand what people have said uh, about the case. But I found it notable uh, among uh, those who uh, found fault with my decision and disagreed with it, um, uh, one in particular uh, person who took umbrage was uh, Phyllis Schlafly. Now, um, I'm sure you know who Ms. Schlafly is, and I won't try to characterize her beyond saying that she is a conservative columnist and a pundit. Uh, I don't know her, and I assume based on her resume that she's a very fine person. And uh, uh, However, uh, under the banner, Judge's Unintelligent Rant Against Design, which was a January column by Ms. Schlafly, she noted, and I'm quoting that, I owe my position as a federal judge entirely to the evangelical Christians who pulled the lever for George W. Bush in 2002 and that I, still quoting here, stuck the knife in those who brought me to the dance in uh, Kitzmiller versus Dover Area School District. Now, other than that, she really liked my opinion. Uh, <laughs> actually, it got worse uh, from there. Uh, Ms. Schlafly obviously enjoys the same First Amendment rights that we all do, and she's entirely free to disagree with my decision, as she most pointedly did. And, and she has a point of view uh, as it involves, uh, in particular, Establishment Clause cases and how we decide them that many people share. But the way that she conducted her analysis, I'm, I'm joking about it, but there's something very serious behind that. The way that she conducted her analysis is instructive, and I would suggest that it points out a problem which is pervasive and which could, I think, at its extreme tear at the fabric of our system of justice. Her column makes it clear that she views me uh, as an activist judge, uh, likely, I would think, in her view, of the very worst kind. A and yet, within her column, and uh, within other criticisms directed at my opinion, time and again the writers would omit to note the role that legal precedent has uh, and that it plays in uh, uh, the way that we decide cases as uh, judges. A and what I mean by that is that I have to follow the law as previously established by the higher courts and in particular by the Supreme Court of the United States. The premise of Ms. Schlafly and some others who criticized the decision would seem to be that uh, judges can and should act in a partisan manner rather than strictly adhering to the rule of law. And that to those who believe that as judges we must cast aside precedent and rule according to an agenda, I will simply say that I believe that the public's dependence upon the impartiality and integrity of judges is absolutely essential to its confidence in our judicial system. It is especially important, in my view, that our citizens understand that judges must be impartial and that the independence of the judiciary is premised on a judge's pledge of freedom from partisan influences. And in the context of the Dover case, there exists over a half century, as I alluded to earlier, of strong legal precedent, which has emanated from the higher courts and particularly the Supreme Court, 
that, among other things, verifies and validates not only the separation of church and state, but also guides us as judges uh, in the way that we uh, would apply these precedents and tests, if you will, to the factual circumstances uh, that we find. Applied correctly, these tests direct us in our determination of whether an act by a governmental entity is violative of the Establishment Clause. I won't bore you with the case names or details, but it's sufficient to say that uh, constrained by this responsibility, applying those tests, which are at least to this point the settled law of the land, that is precisely the exercise that I engaged in in deciding the Dover case. Again, reasonable people may disagree as to whether I correctly applied these cases and precedents, but no rational person I would submit can say that I did not at least try to do so in a way that was correct. Uh, to put it another way, I did not have the power to, nor did I try to invent tests other than those recognized by existing jurisprudence against which, which to measure the facts of the case. Manifestly, I believe that I did what all good judges must do, which, to, which was to approach the case without a political agenda, a bias, a predisposition, or a thought that if a case is decided in a certain way, it, it will offend a political benefactor. As I observed earlier, it's always very risky business, in my view, to divine what the founding fathers might think about current developments. But I feel strongly in, in this way that the process that I engaged in to decide this case is exactly what the founders had in mind when they created the federal judiciary in Article 3 of the United States Constitution. And in fact, I would submit also that had I decided the Dover matter in a different way, had I gone about the process differently, I would have engaged in just the kind of judicial activism which critics decry. That is, to have ruled in favor of the school board based on the facts that I had before me, I would have had to have overlooked precedent entirely and thus impressed upon the facts of the case my sense or the sense of the, my personal sense, or the sense of the public concerning what the law should be and not what it in fact is. I would deem this to be ad hoc justice, and that would be based on uh, preferences or biases or the perceived will of the majority. If you do things that way, as, if we do things that way as judges taken to its, its, its extreme, it is anarchy. At any level, to rule in such a fashion represents the work of truly an activist judge. So the real criticism of my decision, and this is one which I will readily accept, is that I did not, at least in my view, render an activist decision. Now, polls show that many, in some cases depending on the poll, that most Americans believe that uh, it is acceptable to teach creationism uh, in public schools. But let me submit this obvious opinion to you. That is, as citizens, we do not want and, in fact, cannot possibly have a judiciary which operates according to polls or one which rules based upon who appointed us or according to the popular will of the country at any given moment in time. And this is no small matter as it relates to how our fellow citizens view the judiciary. Here in Pennsylvania, I am a member of a commission on judicial independence appointed by the chief judge of our state Supreme Court. This commission has defined judicial independence in this way, a fundamental cornerstone of our justice system and in fact of our federal and state governments is an independent judiciary, the concept that judges decide cases in front of them faithful to the law without fear or favor and free from political or external pressures. It is vital, in my opinion, that we promote judicial independence at every level of the judiciary. I want you not to misunderstand what I say when I talk about judicial independence because many people, when they hear the term judicial independence, think of an unfettered judiciary responsible to no person or entity, one which features judges doing what they please free of accountability. Some people see that as a uh, code uh, phrase for uh, judges freelancing, judges doing what they want. That's not what judicial independence means. That's not what we should seek. Uh, judges are accountable. We should be criticized. Our decisions should be scrutinized. 
uh, greatly scrutinized. Uh, the founders certainly intended that. Where they are inappropriate or wrong, they must be appealed. However, I don't think that we should dumb down the public by implying that judges should decide cases based on an agenda or that they have a responsibility to act in concert with prevailing public opinion, as I noted, or that they should act as according to uh, a snapshot uh, poll uh, that expresses the will of the majority. I think that the press and the public, uh, and I will say again that the press, I think, got it uh, during this trial and, did, and worked mightily to try to explain this, uh, but not everybody reads, and uh, we uh, really uh, need to have a greater civics lesson in the United States about the way judges go about deciding cases, and in particular, again, the role of precedent as it relates to how we decide uh, uh, cases. And I think it's going to promote more respect uh, for the judiciary, and not just because we need it, but because we as judges get our feelings hurt when people criticize our decisions, but I think because it is essential uh, to um, our democracy uh, that there be respect for all three branches of government, the judiciary being uh, simply one. You know, at its worst, the failure by people to understand the proper function of an independent judiciary can lead to results that are not only frightening, but at times tragic. All of you remember the murders of my colleague, uh, Judge Joan Lefkoe's husband and mother uh, last February. Uh, judge Lefkoe is a federal judge, a colleague of mine from Chicago. Her husband and her mother were shot by a disgruntled litigant whose case had been uh, dismissed by Judge Lefkoe just uh, months earlier. This killer uh, was lying in wait for Judge Lefkoe, and when he discovered her loved ones uh, before he found Judge Lefkoe, he shot them instead. Now, we can't know if the killer of uh, Judge Lefkoe's husband and mother, uh, who later then took his own life, was influenced by the, what I think is a creeping disrespect for the judiciary. Uh, however, I'd respectfully suggest that it is entirely possible and likely that, uh, that he was influenced by that. And I, and I want at this point to take it back to my earlier comments about Jefferson and the wall, um, that wall separating church and state. Some people insist on reading the Constitution, in my view, in the same very literal way that they uh, perceive the scriptures. That is, that if the word wall isn't expressly uh, printed, and it's not, um, in the Constitution, then uh, by golly, it doesn't exist. That was stated by some folks uh, publicly throughout the Dover trial. Show me where that exists in the Constitution. I don't accept that there is a wall uh, of separation between church and state. I think when some people preach that, uh, some people who appear on television and, and preach that, I don't think that they're enhancing uh, the debate. And uh, while these uh, uh, televangelists have the same First Amendment rights, again, that we all do, uh, I, I can't imagine that you would, uh, you would think that it adds to the integrity of our system of justice to imply, for example, as one uh, person did, that the whole community of Dover uh, will be without God's help in the event of a disaster uh, on account of the electorate's actions in unseating uh, their school board. Written larger, uh, do comments like this make me feel any more secure as the presiding judge in the Dover case? And I think the answer to that rhetorical uh, question is obvious. As I conclude, let me return to the, to the role of the rule of law, which I think is so fundamental in our system of justice. We, we must never forget that the rule of law is not a conservative uh, or a liberal value. It is assuredly not a Republican, uh, nor is it a Democratic value. Rather, it is an American value. Confidence in the rule of law rests entirely at any given point in time on the character and the integrity of the individual American judge, and that judge's absolute commitment to fairness and impartiality. Judges are mortal, let me assure you, and we are deeply imperfect, let me assure you of that as well. However, we do no favor to the administration of justice when we either impose or imply public or political agendas on judges. I am very thankful for events uh, like tonight, which I think 
elevates the debate and discussion in, in uh, so many ways. By engaging in these types of reasoned uh, discussions, we are, as President Abraham Lincoln used to say, playing to our better angels. Now, you may disagree fundamentally, and I accept if you do uh, disagree with the results uh, reached and the decision that I rendered in the Dover case, but I'm sure that you won't disagree with that thought, uh, that this is a good forum uh, to, uh, to uh, talk about uh, some of these issues. And I thank you again for the rare pr privilege of uh, uh, speaking to you. As I said, it's an honor. And uh, I guess at the conclusion of the, uh, uh, both of our presentations, I'll have the opportunity to, uh, to uh, take uh, uh, some uh, questions. I can't answer all the questions. But I'll tell you which ones I can and which ones I can't. But again, thank you so much uh, for giving me the opportunity to speak to you tonight.